Hi, and welcome to our Evidence of Evolution video here in our evolution unit. The picture I've gone with here is a T-Rex, which I think is as good an example as any of the larger notion that there is a giant pile of evidence to support evolutionary theory. And of course, as a scientist, you should expect that any scientific theory is based on a large supporting body of evidence. The question that we're going to be answering in this video is how do we know that evolution occurs? In this video, we're going to talk about the evidence for an old Earth. We're going to talk about the fossil record. We're going to talk about evidence from comparing anatomy and biochemistry among different organisms. And we're going to look at evidence from evolution in action. These four bins of evidence represent one way of organizing the overall picture of evidence that supports evolutionary theory. It's certainly not the only way, but it's the way that I think makes the most sense, at least to me. Before we start, let's address a fundamental misconception that is sometimes held by people who doubt evolutionary theory, which is this idea that we can't know what has happened in the past. That is absolutely wrong. We absolutely can get ideas about what has happened in the past. We do that by collecting evidence, and we use that evidence to make conclusions about past events. This process is fundamental, not only to science, but also to criminology, to history, and to many other fields of human endeavor. There is nothing that prevents us from collecting evidence about past events to help inform our understanding of what has happened in the past. Just because we were not present to see something happen does not mean that that thing did not happen. That out of the way, let's talk a little bit about Earth's deep history. How do we know what has happened in the past? There are many, many different ways that people collect evidence about what has happened in Earth's history before right now. There are many different ways of dating geological events. I could give an entire course about the different methodologies that are used in order to do this. I'm only going to focus on one methodology, which is radiometric dating. Every radioactive isotope has a characteristic half-life associated with its decay. By measuring the amounts of radioactive isotopes still present in an object compared to the products from that decay, we can estimate the age of the objects that we're investigating. This, for instance, is how we know that the Tyrannosaur fossil that I started off our show with is approximately 65 million years old. This was determined by dating radioactive isotopes found in the fossils and in the rock layers that were surrounding the fossil at the time of discovery. Different radioisotopes will be used for different time horizons. You don't really need to worry about that for the purpose of this course, but you should understand that we can use radioactive dating to date things that are 1,000 years old all the way up to dating of objects that are billions of years old. Another major piece of evidence that supports Earth's history is this idea of continental drift. Continental drift is a foundational theory in the Earth sciences. For the purpose of our discussion here, we can simplify it into the understanding that the Earth's solid crust is broken up into a series of plates that sit upon a liquid mantle. And the long-term motion of these plates contributes to a variety of geological events, such as earthquakes and volcanoes, but also is responsible for the long-term motion of the continents on the surface of the Earth over a time span of hundreds of millions of years. We're also able to use continental drift to back the tape up, so to speak, and determine what the arrangement of the continents was tens of millions or hundreds of millions or even billions of years ago. This is particularly useful when considering the distribution of organisms on Earth today and throughout geological history. Alfred Russell Wallace, who you may remember from our discussions on natural selection, helped to develop these notions of biogeography, which is the larger thought that the organisms that we tend to find, that the organisms we find in one area of the planet tend to be more closely related to each other evolutionarily than they are to organisms that we find in other locations. Certainly this is not always the case, but it does tend to be the case. A classic example of this is looking at the mammals that we find on Australia when compared to the mammals that we find on the other continents. Australia was the first continent to break away. As a result, the evolution of mammals on Australia is fundamentally different from the evolution of mammals on the rest of the continents. Without getting too much into the details, the mammals on Australia tend to be marsupial, which means that the offspring develops in a pouch on the outside of the mother's body. Whereas the mammals that we tend to find on other continents, and you and me, are placental mammals, which means that we develop inside of our mother's bodies in a uterus. And comparing non-Australian placental mammals to the marsupial mammals that we see on Australia, we see that mammals have evolved to occupy very, very similar roles in each case. We see this for all the different niches that mammals have evolved to fill, from mice-like mammals, all the way through to top predators like wolves. The placental mammals are all more closely related to each other 
than they are to any of the marsupial mammals. And the same is true, of course, for the marsupial mammals. Just because there's a marsupial mouse and a placental mouse does not mean that those two mice are closely related to each other evolutionarily. That's the notion of biogeography. The organisms that we find in any one particular area of the planet tend to be more closely related to each other evolutionarily than they are to the organisms that we find on any other area of the planet. When we combine biogeography with our understandings of plate tectonics, we start to understand the distribution of fossils that we see across all of the different continents. Just because two continental areas are not currently close together does not mean that they were not close together at some point during geological time. Another major source of evidence for evolution is the fossil record. The fossil record is useful for a variety of reasons. One of the main reasons it's useful is that it helps us see the evolutionary history or the record of evolution among organisms on Earth throughout geological time. We can see the progressions that have occurred as organisms have evolved and diversified over the billions of years of Earth's history. We can see ancestral forms of organisms that are no longer present on the modern Earth, for instance trilobites ancestors of modern arthropods who have been extinct for about 250 million years but are numerous in the fossil record. And we can also see the so-called transitional fossils or intermediate forms. These are organisms that show characteristics that span between two major modern lineages. I've collected a couple of my favorites. Tiktaalik, which is a transitional fossil between fish and land-based tetrapods like amphibians from about 375 million years ago. This is Archaeopteryx, who of course shows the transition from dinosaurs to birds from about 150 million years ago. And this is uh, the Australopithecus fossil known as Lucy, which shows the transitions from apes to humans from about 4 million years ago. Not only are the transitions important, but the timing of the transitions is also important. For instance, if we found a human fossil from 300 million years ago, that would be tremendously concerning for the theory of evolution. But the fossil record does not show those kinds of temporal inconsistencies. As a result, it's powerful evidence for the notion of continual branching evolutionary processes throughout the history of life. Moving to evidence of evolution that we can see when looking at individual organisms, we take our evidence mostly from morphology and biochemistry. Morphology or anatomy is the structures that we see in an organism, and biochemistry refers to the biological molecules and chemical processes that are at work in all cellular systems. Going to morphology first, we can compare the anatomy between different lineages in order to get some understanding of how they are related to each other evolutionarily. One example of comparative anatomical evidence or homologous structures. These are structures that were present in a common ancestor but have diverged in terms of their function in the organisms that have descended from that common ancestor. This image is showing you the forelimb of four different tetrapods, humans, dogs, birds, and whales. And you can see that in each case they have the same overall plan. They've got one bone here, then two bones here, then a bunch of little blobs, and then a number of fingers. You can see that in each of these animals, that underlying structure has been adapted for the different niches that these organisms fill in their environment, but that underlying structure is powerful evidence to support the notion that all of these organisms share an evolutionary common ancestor. Another useful piece of evidence from comparative anatomy are analogous structures. These are structures that evolved separately in different lineages of organisms, but for a similar or convergent purpose. A good example of this are wings in pterodactyls, bats, and birds. In each case, these wings allow these organisms to fly, but they each evolved independently. And we can see that in the underlying structure of the wing. The pterodactyl wing is hung off of one long finger extension and the leg of the organism. The bat wing incorporates all of the fingers of the bat. And the bird wing, though you can't see it here, is hung off of the arm bones of the bird. The fact that each of these wings has such a different underlying structure helps us understand that these wings each evolved independently, even though they all give the organisms that possess them the same ability to fly. When talking about comparative biochemistry, what we're really interested in is comparing the DNA sequences, RNA sequences, and protein sequences of different organisms. We've discussed this graphic before. It shows how information flows in cellular systems from DNA to RNA to protein. What's useful about this when investigating evolutionary relationships is to look at how these sequences change over time. If we consider a common ancestor, diverging into two different species. Initially, any particular DNA sequence between those two species will be largely identical. However, over time, those sequences will start to accumulate changes as those species evolve away from each other. 
The bottom line for this is that the longer two organisms are evolving away from each other, the more changes we'll see in their DNA sequences, their RNA sequences, and their protein sequences. The more similar these sequences are between any two organisms, the more closely related they are to each other. This is a relatively simple notion, but when applied to nucleic acid and protein sequences that are many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of units long, it's not possible to do this by hand or by eye. And so computers are used to analyze this bulk amount of data and find the differences in different species nucleic acid or in this case, protein sequences. The combinations of fossil evidence combined with morphological comparisons and biochemistry analysis enables phylogeny, which is the branch of biology that seeks to organize all the species that are currently alive in a universal tree of life that starts with our last universal common ancestor. The diagrams that this process generates are frequently referred to as phylogenetic trees. And this is a tree that we've talked about before that is based on the sequence genomes of all of the species on the tree. The last type of evidence that we're going to talk about in this video are examples of evolution in action. We've already looked at some examples of evolution in action back when we talked about examples of natural selection, but I thought we might talk about a couple more here. So these are all different colored carrots that have been produced by humans. And we've talked about this before. This is this notion of artificial selection where different organisms are bred by humans for desirable traits. We can see that in carrots. We can see that in fancy pigeons. And I'm sure that you can see that in your pets as well if you have any. There have also been many examples of observed non-artificial selection evolution in action since scientists have started looking for it. We discussed two of those examples previously in our examples of natural selection video, so I'm not gonna go into them in detail here, but I just wanna acknowledge that they do in fact exist and they do provide evidence to support evolutionary theory. And thanks so much for watching our discussion of the evidence that supports evolution. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how each of the sources of evidence presented in this video support evolutionary theory. Make sure you can explain how they support the evolutionary process, common ancestry of all living things, or evidence to support the notion of a very old earth that gives us the kind of timescales we need for evolution to result in the diversity of life that we see on the planet these days. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.